So thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation, for the thesis. I really appreciate it. It was really clear, a very clear idea with all um, the details uh, very well explained. And I have a bunch of questions. I don't know how much I should keep going, so please stop me when, uh, when it's time. Um, so the first one is, uh, so if, if I understand correctly, so your argument about the migration, the vertical migration is that the plankton needs to migrate north to forage and then to go back um, deep down to escape predators, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. But of course, okay, it, I yeah. mean, yeah, it's more complex than this. I mean, there are, there are other reasons for this planktonic organism to actually perform this migration, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you uh, tried to estimate or to account for the fact that there are vertical motions in the ocean um, independent on the active motility of this uh, plankton and try to compare the efficiency, of course that's not controlled, so they would have to go with the flow, but um, is there, um, did you attempt any comparison between the efficiency of the mechanism? And now I can't see you. Okay, I so... I probably hear you, I can hear you, but I cannot see you, I don't know yeah. if that might have been a problem with the zoom, but uh, I, I hear you, I hear you. So, uh, so, so indeed, there are, there are in the ocean, there are, especially near the coast, there are some really large-scale currents that, would, uh, that could carry a planktonic organism at the surface, right? So that was your question, if we... Yeah. yeah. Especially if, because there, if this is um, a regular migration, then it, it could take advantage of uh, diurnal cycles or whatever regular patterns in the ocean circulation. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's right. That's something that we we could consider. And uh, and and what's nice about the surfing strategy is actually it doesn't only work in turbulence. Actually, turbulence is quite an extreme case. And so you could be able to exploit also large-scale currents and, uh, and then to see how it would change with respect to their own swimming velocity. This I don't know because I don't have the, the order of magnitudes of this large-scale right. vertical currents in mind compared <coughs> to their velocity. But, right. yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, from the discussions I had with uh, oceanographs, I mean, they actually hear one copy was when they are doing their measures of the of the deep flow, um, uh, I mean of the ground of the of the ocean. They actually hear when copy are are you know are coming up when the sun goes down. So it's really it feels to me like it's really uh, an active behavior that lets them go up. Okay, yeah, so basically what, what, what I was asking is whether you had in mind an order of magnitude of the vertical currents versus the efficiency, so the effective speed of the surfing strategy, but I think you probably haven't looked at that. No, 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 we, we haven't, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, um, so um, another question is, uh, how do you think this would translate it into because there's a uh, there are a lot of parameters that you discuss in deep in the thesis and one i think maybe one of the most important ones is this uh, tau this correlation time and uh, i was wondering how do you think the surfing strategy would translate to a different problem so the problem that you mentioned of uh, following or escaping a target um, and particularly whether they would have to adapt their uh, parameters, so their response, and specifically this time scale in, in some way to adapt to what is the thing that they are going after or escaping from. Okay, okay, so that's, a, that's a, indeed a, a nice other problem. So the first thing that I would say is that if the target is actually very far, if imagine we can, we can try to, to, to get to it and uh, we can detect it with uh, long-range sensors such as uh, 
you know, light, light sensing, if it's biodiminescent, for example, then if it's very far, then, you know, your direction toward your target will be kind of constant. And in that case, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, of course, the surfing strategy would also work. But when we will get closer to that target, of course, this target direction will tend to change. And then, of course, our time horizon, our correlation time that we use to uh, parameterize our surfing strategy will tend to decrease and would be kind of like the, the, the minimum between the characteristic time scale of variation of the flow velocity gradient, but also of our measure of the direction. Thanks. Um, so the next question is uh, about uh, the comparison between surfing, which is um, uh, with the RL. And I was wondering if, if you can rationalize why RL doesn't learn the surfing strategy. Is it because of how, how you define um, the states and actions or how you represented the environment? Why doesn't it learn the strategy? Yeah, okay, so uh, there are lots of things to... Do, do you see my, uh, my plot here? Yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, there's a lot uh, not to say, actually. So indeed, what we can see in this plot is that the surfing strategy is actually performing much better in a similar Reynolds number flow than if we use a reinforcement learning technique that we found in uh, literature. But uh, of course, to obtain this reinforcement learning, you have to learn a strategy in that uh, in that turbulent flow. And already being able to me in that sense uh, able to learn something in turbulence because of high stochasticity is already important. And what is already kind of impressive. And what's why is this performance very small compared to the to that of the surfing strategy? Is because because it's very hard to actually learn something in turbulence, they have to uh, discretize a lot their strategies. So they only have access to actually a few different possible states that are discrete. Rather in our surfing strategy, our set of states is actually our measure of the flow velocity gradient that is continuous. And also their state of action is also uh, discrete rather than our surfing strategy is really is continuous. So we have a huge advantage over uh, over them, actually. But this is kind of the state of the art. I mean, that was the state of the art of learning a navigation strategy in turbulence uh, in uh, 2020, and that's why we used it as a comparison. But uh, indeed, I would expect if a continuous set of state and a continuous set of action uh, is used in, uh, in, uh, to learn a strategy in turbulence, I would expect it to actually be at least as, uh, as uh, perform as well as the surfing strategy and actually outperform because we know that the surfing strategy is actually only a, a linear approximation of the optimal strategy. Yeah, it, it, uh, I just, I, I find it uh, very interesting. I think that um, well, maybe there could be things to do in the sense that it, it would be useful to extract some, um, like, a, you could do the inverse, right? You have your um, surfing strategy, which is uh, uh, basically a full solution, and it's in continuous states and actions, and you could discretize it and see why it performs less well. In the end, you have an analytical expression, which is, um, very simple and amenable, and one could say, uh, a posteriori, does this, if I discretize the strategy itself, does it, when does it fail, and why does it fail, and this exactly. could teach you something about what's the best way to discretize RL in a way that learns this strategy. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good or idea, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be easy to discretize the surfing strategy and see at which point we achieved exactly the same performance and see when we actually, when it actually doesn't uh, influence performance. But yeah, 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 it would be a nice idea. We, we discussed it at some point, but we didn't really get through it. Okay. Um, okay. 
the other question I had was uh, if you can tell us something about the performances low at low Reynolds numbers. Okay. I just find it not very intuitive, but. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, this plot is strange, I don't know why. Anyway, okay, the performance is low. Yeah, the performance is low at low Reynolds number just because we have a zero mean, right? And this means that actually when you have a very low Reynolds number, you actually, uh, you actually don't really exploit the flow because there is almost no flow. But also consider that here we actually, the, the swimming velocities here correspond to the Kolmogorov velocity scale for each Reynolds number, right? So in that case, the, there is kind of a rescaling that occurs here, and, uh, and that explains this low performance. I don't know if I'm very clear, but, uh, but the, the main idea is that at, f at very low Reynolds number, we, we don't actually have any flow to actually to exploit. Okay, okay. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, so uh, another question was, uh, uh, so you discussed, uh, um, presented some arguments about how heavy are computations uh, for the brain. And I was wondering if you have any idea whether there's a way to measure this or how, because you wrote this, and I was wondering if you, if there are data, if there are people who study this quantitatively. Okay. Or is it just a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so indeed we discussed the computational power that would require to, to, you know, to perform and to compute this matrix <coughs> exponential. And so, I mean, to my knowledge, there is no precise quantitative uh, studies that describe this computational power. So I really don't know uh, actually what they are capable of. We know that they have neurons, so they can do some some computations for sure, but uh, to what extent, I don't know. And that's why we actually wanted to, you know, to, to assess the robustness of this because you know, computing an exponential power, I mean, even for us, it would be, would be kind of hard, right? Hard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question was, uh, so you discussed boundaries at some point. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if, uh, you are thinking about a specific situation. When are boundaries relevant for this problem? Okay. So actually, uh, I mean, so boundaries. You mean like ground or the or the flow? I mean, are, do they live in? Are you thinking shallow waters? Or are you thinking what? What? What is the? Okay. Are you thinking close to the coast or? Yeah. So so I discussed a bit boundaries for. I mean, uh, I consider the turbulent channel flow. Uh, for two reasons. The first one was to assess surfing performance in an environment that is not homogeneously turbulent, right? So can the surfing strategy be adapted so that it can, you know, change its response, change the, its parameterization of the, this value of this parameter tau to kind of try to adapt to different turbulence intensity levels. So that the, the first thing that we did. And the second thing that is was more extensively treated in, uh, in the appendix was actually to discuss uh, the problem of uh, settlement, actually. You, you, if you want to settle on a surface, if, uh, for example, the sea snail uh, wants to settle uh, as a darva on a, on a substrate, it needs to find a boundary of the, of the flow, so it needs to find the ground to, to, to settle on. And while it can be done using, for example, the, the sensing of gravity, if you have a statochist, uh, if you don't have it, and if you want to actually find boundaries that are not you know, horizontal and boundaries that are vertical, you would need also to, to, to be able to measure somehow the direction to that boundary. So this is another thing that is discussed in, in the context of this I mean, horizontal dispersion problem and trying to find a settlement area in which to, to settle. Okay. Um, then I uh, had a comment about, uh, so at some point you discussed about the Dijkstra um, 
shortest path and then the their mellow problem. Indeed. And it, it, it seems to me that so the extra is the is uh, local, so the, the total shortest path would be the sum of the of uh, the individual shortest path. But Zermelo, wouldn't you need to um, travel inefficiently sometimes to find the faster currents nearby? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. The, the problem of the Zermelo equation is that it provides a differential equation, but it doesn't provide the initial condition. So you would need to try a lot of different initial conditions and try to see which one actually go, go, goes faster. And that's actually a big problem, uh, I think, about the, the Zermo way to solve navigation problems. Okay, great. I have um, maybe one last uh, question, which is, I think you measured, uh, you mentioned at some point uh, uh, memory, and I was wondering, because you talk about filtering, the effect of filtering, Indeed. and I was wondering if there would be a way to use memory instead of uh, filtering, so measuring um, your sensing cues at different points, maybe along the trajectory and, and keeping some memory of some sort, and use that to average out fluctuations? Or did, did you think about how to introduce memory in the problem? Or Yeah, yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. So that's something actually I tried. So I, even though in my thesis I plotted only uh, spatial filtering. I also kind of tried uh, temporal filtering to try to kind of introduce some uh, some memory effects in this uh, in this strategy. But uh, the the problem you faced is what that I I, really, I didn't see anything really interesting there. But for sure, I mean, uh, planktonic organism. Even if we know that actually bacteria are able to 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 perform different different time, uh, time measures, for sure, I mean, copy pods would have some kind of memory. But other than trying to, 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 to actually compute, uh, OK, this, these terms for which you would need memory to compute, I don't think that actually f uh, temporal filtering would be of any help for this uh, planktonic organism because the the fact that spatial filtering might be uh, a good thing to do to perf uh, uh, swimming performance is that it kind of provides you an information in the future because you will kind of average out everything that is around you and what will happen in the future. However, I think that temporal filtering uh, only you know you only try to to yeah to, to, to use only your past measures so you wouldn't if you do not introduce a model like like this where you actually use memory to try to predict the future just filtering wouldn't be that useful right and that okay. maybe explains why I don't see any performance improvement for instance okay. Uh, thank you very much for me. Uh, I'm good, so you can pass to the next uh, person. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. So we have Eric. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for the presentation. So I fully agree with the first uh, referee for the present excellent document, and also the presentation was very clear. Uh, what I really appreciated was the the streamline of your. Uh, scientific approach, starting with something that seems to be very simple, and finally uh, showing that it is robust by adding more and more complexity on the flow, but also on the trajectory equation, and show finally that this uh, strategy is very robust and efficient. Uh, so I really like the, the way you uh, um, analyze the data, and also we were talking about the uh, computation of the a matrix exponential that probably a couple of cannot do, uh, but uh, you, you explain what are the, the physical uh, uh, ideas uh, behind the first term, the second term, the third term, and so on, and then we can understand that even a simple organism would be able to take very of the code. Mm -hmm. So this, I, yeah. I found it very uh, interesting and, and progressive. So from that, uh, I Thanks a lot. Um,
so of course I have a few questions. Um, so first, first the detail in your... Oh, yeah, the second point is the amount of work that is well summarized in slide 34. Yeah. Because you selected for documentation a few things of all the work that you did. So also for that, that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, so the questions. Um, on your slide uh, 22, uh, okay. So you show the evolution of the, uh, the efficiency, uh, and I don't, or maybe I miss it in the, in the document, but don't you have the data below 0.5? Okay, so the, the, the big problem of turbulence is that it disperses <coughs> everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, if we, I, I want to keep a similar uncertainty here, mm -hmm. I need the, the, the slower I go, I need to put more and more particles because my drift upwards will be less and less obvious, right? And so that's why I don't have any point below 0.5 in this figure, uh, because actually uh, you, <laughs> then you, 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 I mean, I reach the limits of what I could do. But that's something actually I did with the smaller Reynolds numbers, because you need less, you have less dispersion, okay. and it seems consistent to, to say that even though it's not proved, of course, you could always go further, right? But, uh, but it's consistent to say that it wouldn't budge. And actually, what limits performance here compared to a early green flow is actually the unsteadiness of the flow. So if you, are not, if you are not able to swim fast enough to actually get to the maximal flow velocity that you can reach, that would be the, the Komogov velocity. But then the, the, the time scale of that of that um, of that uh, structures for, uh, that you try to exploit will disappear before you get to that maximum velocity, mm -hmm. and that's actually why here what's limiting is actually the time, the lifetime of our features. While here what is limiting is that you cannot access to larger features of the flow because you are performing kind of a gradient ascent, so you are limited by the smaller scale you can find. But if you do so in a Taylor green in a Taylor green flow, because it's not unsteady, actually performance would explode right here, because you will always have the time to reach the extreme limit of the flow, and then you will, you you would have a speed up that would be amazing if you are sw swimming very slowly. This is just due to the unsteadiness of our. <laughs> yeah, but also you should have for this swim quite zero nothing. Exactly, exactly. So uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, discontinuity at some point. Yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. Um, so that comes to the point you, you were mentioning about the, the Kolmogorov scales. Uh, so you decided to, uh, to scale all your data by this Kolmogorov length and velocity scale, mm -hmm. which is good because you have dimensionless numbers. And then you use this uh, dimensional, uh, dimensionless analysis in order to have this uh, analysis on the relevance in biophysics, and then you can test different uh, species, which is good. But uh, are you sure that these are the relevant scales of turbulence to make the, the problem dimensional? OK, so that's a very good question. Uh, so of course, we could use a lot of different scales, because turbulent flows are, have multi, multi scales, so of course. So one first thing that we can note is that because it's based on a gradient ascent, a succession of gradient ascent, we are locally only able to use the smallest scales of the flow. But I agree, if I'm in a, in, a, uh, in a yellow region here, of course the scale of the flow features that I sense, you measuring the flow velocity gradient, is actually much bigger, right? And so in average, the, uh, maybe, you would surf on uh, on uh, actual um, on the for example the Taylor scale of the flow, but it's <coughs> not that simple because you are still limited. If you end up even if it's rare, if you end up in a small scale of the flow, Kolmogorov scale of the flow, because you are performing again a gradient ascent, you will be limited. So even if you start swimming a bit faster uh, here, you won't really surf on. Uh, larger scales of the flow because you, you want their performance will be already limited by this flow scales. And quantitatively, where we can see that at least this scale is relevant, but I don't think that's actually the only relevant scale of the flow, is that this transition actually occurs for one of the Kolmogorov scale. So this is kind of 
I don't know, it's not a hard proof for sure, but we can also see that for, if we normalize by the root mean square velocity, that's kind of also when we achieve uh, a performance of one. So my belief is that actually the Reynolds number and the, separ the scale separation between these two, um, these two, these two uh, flow velocities is actually important. However, we can see that because of the universality of turbulence and our results that we had, we had very little difference of performance between our Reynolds number of, you know, of 20 and the Reynolds number of uh, 480, right? In terms of, we didn't have much difference. We have a different parameterization, in this I agree, and maybe actually what would be the best renormalization for the parameterization of the surfing strategy would be maybe a Taylor scale time. But however, I mean, for, for performance, it seems that, you know, already at the, the, uh, the Komogok scale, some, some things happen. Yeah. But of course, we could renormalize. For me, the, if you come back to the, the plot where you have the, um, the performance as a uh, function of the training scale, for different Reynolds number? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, yeah. if you have a, a real Kolmogorov scaling, all the data should collapse in the Exactly, system. exactly. I so agree. Of course, for, for Reynolds lambda 21, yeah. we cannot say that this is turbulent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No exactly. Exactly. But exactly. Exactly. if you have four, let's say, uh, 400, 200, 100, and maybe yeah. more, we should expect that yeah. we have a, a collapse of some observable exactly. when we vary the Reynolds number. And, and that's, that's something we, we really wanted to do at some point, but I mean, we were kind of limited by our mm -hmm. numerical capabilities, but yeah, that's something we, we would need to, to check. And actually, if, uh, if uh, you know, if mm -hmm. we okay. didn't, I mean, we could okay. change uh, that. Okay. I have another question about the the way the, the strategy is um, tested in your PhD, so you, you, you broke up all the different terms and finally you have shown that the most important <coughs> term is the horizontal component of the vorticity. Yeah. Um, again, if we, if we place that in uh, the idea that some uh, microorganisms are able to do something, um, uh, probing the vorticity is not easy because that is solid body rotation and exactly. that will not uh, generate any deformation of the antenna and anything like that. Indeed. So, so we cannot really expect that they can sense the vorticity. So my question is, do you think that we can uh, uh, have, for example, an adaptation of your strategy by uh, switching the horizontal vorticity uh, to, P, uh, to P dot? Because P dot yeah, exactly. is something that can be sensed by the organism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so indeed, so I didn't do exactly this because it's a bit complex for sure. Because you need to be able to, I think you actually not only need to measure P dot, but the time derivative of P dot to actually know mm -hmm. how fast you're, you're, you're yeah. swimming. And you also need to know your own swimming power and how much you are contributing to your own reorientation if you want to measure this from a statocast. However, what I did here, I anticipated your, your question, uh, is that I tried to see if we only have the, the measure of one component of the flow vorticity that is in the plane of P and, uh, and D. Okay, so the thing that you could maybe deduce from the measure of this angle, and we can see that still it kind of works. So of course, performance drops, indeed. But know that this is still something like it's the minimal performance that you could achieve because if you have time uh, measures and uh, you can build some, some correlation based on the variation of this angle, you maybe can get also access to higher order and other components of the vorticity. Because if you, you know, if you turn like this, then you will some, somehow have correlation between this measure of this angle and the, the this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. But you said, you said it's, it would be hard to uh, yeah. implement in the... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Having the angle is, uh, I mean, it's not that hard, but you, you need to formulate properly the, the problem to see how really you can extract flow vorticity, because if you want to apply the surfing strategy, 
you will need a measure of the flow velocity rate. So you really need to think how to translate this measure of the gradient and the temporal derivative of this gradient with a measure of vorticity. And that's, I mean, it, it's possible to do it for sure, but uh, I mean, I didn't really get into it. Um, I have another question about uh, the test that you did about uh, the filtering. Yeah. Um, and uh, so my question is not about the filtering. Okay. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, at the, it, there is one uh, one chapter where you, you placed your approach in the more general uh, uh, framework with the and design and so on. And you have shown that actually your uh, strategy is very efficient. It's less efficient than if you know all the flow. Of course, of course. Of course. Uh, so my question is, uh, did you think or did you try to uh, to go progressively for, uh, from knowing only the local information yeah. to knowing the full information on the full domain, like you did for the filtering with the idea that the uh, microorganism is able to sense the flow at a certain distance, over a certain distance. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so that's what I did here. Okay, uh, sorry. Okay. That's what I did here. So for example, okay. here I used the dextra algorithm, and we can see that when we increase, we get a smoother trajectory. So here we can see that actually increasing it more is actually less performant, but I think it's just a matter of you know, integration. If I really could do this for very long range uh, uh, trajectories, then it would be more efficient if we increase this mm -hmm. characteristic, characteristic length of the, of the graph that corresponds kind of our characteristic time of our surfing strategy. Right? And, and would it be also effective in the in turbulence? I think so, but it's not, I mean, it's, uh, we, you cannot evaluate this in turbulence because it's far too complex for sure. Because, uh, I mean, this already in a Taylor Green flow took me forever to compute because, uh, <laughs> I mean, the graph is a lot and you will need to have a very high resolution because you will need to have a resolution that is, uh, that, that is big enough so that you really can uh, characterize properly this, uh, the cosmograph scales and, the, I mean, the smallest scales of the flow. So it could be used for sure. It would be very interesting, but it would, be, would need a lot of computational power. Yeah. Um, I have maybe one, uh, yeah, two open questions. Uh, one is uh, related to uh, reinforcement uh, learning. Yeah. Um, so you, you did some tests with uh, what is available in the literature, but yeah. um, among the different parameters that you have in your, in your surfing strategy, which is the swimming speed, in a certain sense, we can, exp we can say that the microorganism can um, change the swimming speed. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also change uh, the uh, time horizon, mm -hmm. and it can also maybe change the, the time for reorientation. These are things that could be measured, for example, if you, yeah. if you change the place of the chloroplast, then you can change the time for reorientation. Okay. Among these three uh, physical uh, parameters of your problem, which of the three do uh, you think could be uh, best evaluated by a re reinforcement learning to optimize the, the strategy of, uh, of navigation. I think the first thing that I would do, and that's actually what we do in our group right now with another PhD student, is to try to assess the, uh, to, to try to be able to, 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 to use the surfing strategy, mm -hmm. but to try to control with reinforcement learning the time horizon as a local uh, as a function of the local measure of the, the gradient. Because of course, if we are able to kind of assess somehow from the flow, because we know that there are correlations with, with the flow velocity gradient and the characteristic acceleration of this flow velocity gradient. And uh, yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> it would be nice for reinforcement learning to be able to, to find and so to optimize. Like, like what you did with the channel flow? Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 but it's very simple what we did. So it could be, it could be more complex. And because the, swim, the swimming speed could be also something that. Yeah, yeah, indeed, you indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the 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 thing is about swimming speed is that um, there there is no real interest to actually not swim as ma at maximal velocity, right? Because your performance will always be linked to your swimming velocity. So if you, at some point, if you don't swim 
uh, fast enough, you will kind of lose something. So, but, but, but of course, I mean, we could consider variations of this swimming velocity, but I think if we consider a variation of this swimming velocity, we need to consider another as problem. You, as you show here, for example, if you have um, an organism for which the nominal swimming speed corresponds to 10, yeah. then there is an advantage to swim uh, slower. Okay, in, in this using this performance criteria for sure, mm -hmm. but you know if you if you uh, even though you no maybe maybe it's best here. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I get that. Uh, no, it's here. Yeah, it's here. But if you change this performance criteria, actually your effective migration speed, if you go slower. You still go slower, right? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, to, tra to travel, yeah. to travel so on top of the water. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So in terms, in terms of performance, it's better, but in terms of time to reach the surface, yeah. it's less. Yeah. But I mean, from an energetic point of view, it could be interesting. In that mm. case. And that has been treated also a bit in my PhD, where we considered on-off behaviors. Mm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, we, we we can say some things about that. But for this specific vertical migration problem. It's yeah. a final question. Um, in many um, studies of the literature, uh, where this problem has been addressed, uh, not really in the term of navigation, we have observed that uh, um, there is a correlation between the, the, the time to travel across the water column and clustering. Is yeah. it something that you had a look to, so uh, to, to look at? Perfect. A preferential concentration of these microorganisms in your turbulence. So, okay, so that's again very interesting. I think that would be a very interesting thing to actually investigate after that. For sure, as we, as we show, because surfers are actually able, uh, actually trying to find the same, uh, in the same region. And so I didn't really do any uh, analysis of clustering. Uh, but it would be interesting to see how this affects and uh, I mean could be correlated to actually what they do when they try to, to see the settlement of inertial particles in, uh, in turbulence for instance where they see this, uh, this clustering. Uh, but one more effect is because of the generality of the surfing strategy, you actually don't, have, don't need turbulence to exploit the flow, it can be any flow. Mm -hmm. It could also be the flow that is generated by another serving plankton organism. And so this is very preliminary and that was actually an idea of uh, Michel. But if I put some surfers here and where I plot the flow that is generated, the Stokes flow generated by this particle that is just represented as Stokes net, right now it's not, I mean, we would need a bit more. We can see also some kind of aggregation, right? Because they will they will, uh, because they will want to try to follow in the wake of other planktonic organisms, they will try to kind of aggregate right here. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I didn't know that, but I would suggest instead of the stress set, to use the stress set. Stress test and uh, stress any, any kind of square model or, yeah, for sure, for sure. But, I mean, this is preliminary. Yeah. I just did this for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. That was very, very nice and very well represented. Okay, nice. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, um, Michel, you there? You want to ask questions? Yeah, we can't see Remy. The video is gone. But it's okay. I can still hear you. Oh, we can. We can. We can yeah, we hear you. No problem. And we see you actually. Okay, I just don't see you, but that's okay. Um, okay, great. So I really liked how you tested the robustness of the surfing strategy to all of the, um, to lots of things, right? Lots, all, a lot of the assumptions. But I was wondering if about some of the assumptions you made about the swimmers. So you assume they're spherical, that they're inertialist that they're very small relative to the length scales of the flow and that they swim constantly. I mean, there's a lot of assumptions. And I was wondering if you could speculate on which one of these might be most important when applying to real organisms. Okay, so yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of them, for sure, for sure, for sure. And uh, I think, I mean, I mean, every, every, every kind of 
possible uh, possible assumption that we did is actually is actually I think would be kind of important, and that's why it's kind of interesting that when take a separate thing, for example, when we use the filtering effect or when we try the robustness to noise, etc., we kind of see that the surfing strategy is robust. But yeah, to, to, to go further, unfortunately, we need to, 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 to improve the model. We would need to Im improve the model in any ways, in many ways, kind of, uh, to, to account for all the complexity. And then we kind of reach the limits of our simulation. We actually did all these assumptions to, to be able to perform these simulations. But maybe one thing that I can maybe I can talk about a bit is for example inertia. And that's also one interesting effect that we completely neglected while for instance cup papers are actually swimming very fast, right? And so we expect inertial effects to, to, to happen here. And these are actually inertial effects have been studied for uh, settling particles, just passive particles that are settling in a flow velocity uh, field. And we can see that we obtain kind of a speed up for an inertial delay. Here's the inertial delay. Sorry, it's not the right, right thing. And uh, we can see that for a given value of the inertial delay, we'll have an enhancement of this setting. Here I uh, show in the open symbol exactly the surfing strategy trying to settle as fast as possible. However, uh, we, we, uh, we, the, 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 plan, the simulated plankton is actually inertial using a heavy inertial model. And we can see that even though, uh, I mean, our model actually, our optimal solution wouldn't be optimal in this configuration, we can see that it's still very robust and still performs much better than uh, just setting particles, even though they are inertial and we have this speed up effect here. One other thing that we can do just to explain this plot is try to reformulate our surfing strategy, trying to include uh, analytically the effect of inertia for slow values of this inertial time. And if, when, if we do so, we try to anticipate a bit on our inertia, that we can only do, it only works for small values of our time, of, of this inertial time, and otherwise the, I mean, our model breaks down. But we can see that we don't have a lot of improvement. And of course, when inertial time increases, our model completely breaks down, and that explains this uh, poor performance. But, I mean, that's kind of, that was kind of surprising for me, because, uh, I mean, for me, inertia is important, and actually have an important impact on, you know, uh, passive setting particles, but doesn't seem to influence a lot uh, sur the surfing strategy in any way. Kind of. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, yeah. I mean, all this additional complexity could be improved by, it could be added by using experiments and actually doing experiments on micro drones, so that we don't have to simulate everything, right? Yeah. Uh, but then you don't, you can't measure or you can't control their behavior in the experiments. Of course, of course, um, that's, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> so along those lines, one of the things I was interested when you were doing the filtering of the, the turbulence, um, and in that case, though, you still had a the, the plankton that swim faster still have lower performance than the lower swimming plankton, but they still respond. Um, there was maybe some benefit to interpreting the filtered flow field. Right? Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Sure. Sorry. So, I was wondering. You're still assuming that these are very small, but what if they were slightly larger so that they could, um, they, they, how, so how would an organism filter the turbulence? Is that because they have memory or is that because they're larger than the smallest scales of the flow? It, when I studied uh, the, the, the effect of filtering, it, it, I had in mind this finite size effects that if you actually too large, or if you have like these antennules that would let us let you access to, you know, 
larger scales of the flow, then what will happen if you, you, you have to kind of filter the flow flow? But of course, I mean, finite size effects are very complex and are not limited to, the, to both the inclusion separately of inertia and the filtering. It's, uh, we would need to, to perform more advanced simulations where we actually compute the flow velocity that is induced by, uh, by a planktonic organism. And this would be more heavy to perform, for sure. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you think you could enhance the surfing of those finite size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And that's kind of what I show here. It's like, um, it seems that, so here I plot the surfing performance as a function of the, this filtering length, right? And so when we're swimming very slowly, we can see that because we degrade our information, just performance decrease when we uh, filter more the flow velocity flow. But then what we seem to see, so there is a lot of dispersions in my point, unfortunately, but what we seem to see is that when we try to increase flow velocity, I mean, uh, accessing to, you, you, you have more time to actually try to achieve and uh, the, to reach the, the preferential uh, region of larger scales of the flow. So if you are able to filter the flow, kind of, you would be able to access, uh, sorry, uh, here we go. Yeah. You would be able to kind of access larger gradients and have larger improvements because you will be able to filter out the small fluctuation that would block you if you are not filtering the flow. So my answer to this, my intuition about this and based on these results would be that the, the, if your swimming velocity is large, then of course it would be more beneficial to actually have access to larger scales of the flow with more filtering. Then, uh, however, if you are very small compared to the smallest case of the flow, I mean, filtering will be, will be a disadvantage. Okay, great. And then I have one final quick question, which is just, so they're, uh, the surf, when they're surfing, they're preferentially concentrating. So would you, so that would mean the surfers might cluster or aggregate, and is that ecologically relevant at all? You kind of already touched on that. Yeah, yeah, so of course, I mean, I mean we, we observed uh, aggregation in the ocean. So, uh, of course, if, even though it hasn't, to my, knowledge, to my knowledge, really been really, you know, accounted for, I mean, there are many effects that cause these aggre aggregates to form that we actually call marine stone. And um, for, for the others in the room. And uh, maybe an active behavior of this uh, of plankton organism actually uh, it contributes to the aggregations uh, to the aggregation and the formation of this aggregate and marine stone. So it would be, I, in my opinion, it would be uh, relevant. But I mean, I cannot know for sure. That's really something that I didn't really get deep into. Okay. Thanks. That's all the questions I have. Thanks a lot, Michel. Thank you, thank you very much. We had uh, several questions. Maybe I can close with just one. That is Mimi, your smoker. Mimi. Sorry. <laughs> I found a list. She's not in the list. I see she's no, invited. She's she's okay. So Mimi, are you online? Yes. So yeah. it's my turn. It's your yeah. turn, yeah. Hi, Mimi. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Very nice talk. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. So, um, uh, one question I have is you assume a spherical organism. And um, for that um, situation, no matter what orientation they're in, um, they're always going to be rotated by the local vorticity. And we know from models of um, swimmers of different shapes in, in that same Johns Hopkins turbulence that you used, that oblongs uh, will rotate in the shear and then line up with it. And so they will travel differently through the fluid um, than, or through the turbulence than a sphere. And so my question for you is, have you yet 
thought about uh, making an oblong copepod like they actually are, and it, do, do you think that the strategy would change um, if, if instead of always being rotated the same no matter what, they would rotate in uh, some orientations relative to the flow, and in others they line, you know, they'll rotate till they line up with the shear, and then they'll swim along those directions. So um, I don't think you've looked at this yet, but if you have, tell me. If not, tell me how, how you think you would um, deal with that question. Okay, so that's, uh, again, that's interesting. And that's also something that we tried. So for the sake of the simplicity of this presentation, I considered all these spherical shapes because it was easier to write the model, etc. But we also tried to, to check the, the, what, ha what would happen with elongated swimmers. And indeed, uh, it has been done a lot in the, in the, in the past. We, uh, we would see that actually combining with bottom heaviness, for example, if you absolutely have no behavior, you have a swimming planktonic organism that is always swimming and is only reoriented thanks to bottom heaviness and the shear and vorticity of the flow, then you would see a, a, a speed up compared to actually spherical swimmers. This is already uh, swimmers if, uh, to, on the migration performance. Right? And, and so actually what we, we, what we can see if we go at the beginning of, our, my, of my PhD thesis is if we place surfing planktonic organisms inside a simple shear flow, we will observe that the surfing strategy is actually telling you to align with the shear. So, the fact that elongated swimmers are aligning with the shear is actually helping this planktonic organism to perform something that is similar to the surfing strategy, but in a passive way. But that's indeed something that, that, uh, that is important, the shape of uh, planktonic organisms. And that can be simulated, yeah. So, um, uh, so my question is thinking about real zooplankters, would the um, strat if you're elongated and you line up with the shear, uh, can you use your modeling approach to predict uh, how the organism should try to align itself relative to what it's sensing about the flow, and would that be different? You know, are there different optima depending on your length to width ratio? Um, so, yeah, yeah, so indeed, for example, if you only have a statokist, okay, and you are not able to measure... I have to tell you, so, uh, you're hard to hear. You suddenly became hard to hear. Have you Sorry? moved away from a microphone or something? Is it better now? Yes. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Perfect. So, yeah, so um, indeed, if you only have a statokist, for instance, and you are not able to measure the flow strain, Actually, you would only be able to measure to react to the flow vorticity, right? So having an elongated shape could let you actually uh, align yourself with the, with the local strain and, only, and then your reaction would only be uh, with vorticity. So in any ways, for sure, it would influence your reaction to the flow because you would have to account for this of uh, strain-induced rotation because of your elongated shape. But I would say that having an elongated shape actually helps you performing the strategy because it already aligns you in a way that you would like to align. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, but, but, oops. <laughs> Excuse me, my computer just wants me to, it, it obliterated you and it wants me to um, uh, update some software. So let me get back to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. My whole screen went to this update. Um, so we know that some um, uh, zooplankton uh, sense their own rotation. So they would be, uh, there's, their behavioral response would be to vorticity, whereas others don't react to their own rotation at all, like some of the larvae we've studied, but they uh, can sense local shear over their um, sensing organs. And so do you think that the, um, if you only sensed your own rotation, would there be a different 
optimal strategy to try to serve from if you could sense local shear? So, uh, so in practice, what we can do is whatever the, the measure of the flow velocity gradient you have, either the symmetric part, if you can ma only measure shear, or the anti-symmetric part, if you only measure vorticity, you can still plug it in the surfing strategy, even though it's not the full, you know, uh, flow velocity gradient. It would, and what we show here is that it actually would work, uh, because that's exactly what we did. We tried to, to see how it would perform if we only had the flow shear that is represented by S here, and these are the represented in these blue curves, and, uh, and uh, with only flow vorticity if we have uh, far that is represented by these green triangles. And we can see that at maximum, for the optimal parameter, surfing parameter that corresponds to is each of these partial sensing of the flow, uh, we obtain this kind of performance. And what we observe is that measuring vorticity to perform the surfing strategy act would actually be better than only measuring strain. But even though we are only able to measure strain, we still obtain like something like a 20% improvement, which is already kind of significant. Right. Okay, uh, now I want to move on to uh, a question that got asked earlier, but I want to uh, dive into it a little more, okay. which is uh, when you are near a physical surface. And I'm thinking about the larvae that you talked about. And uh, when they first hatch out of an egg or are released by their mother, they're on the substratum and they want to get away from the substratum and up into the free stream flow that will disperse them. And when they're competent and ready to settle down on the bottom again, they have the opposite problem. They want to get to a surface. And in real marine habitats, the uh, flow over a surface is a turbulent benthic boundary layer. Uh, and uh, it, surfaces can be where organisms need to land can be vertical or can be horizontal, and uh, they can be above the organism or below the organism, uh, depending, you know, if it's a barnacle settling on a ship bottom versus on the sea floor or on a piling. And so my question uh, is, uh, thinking about the way you've modeled this, if you had, um, we also know in benthic boundary layers that the shears are very high uh, near surfaces and that if you have a small object uh, moving with the flow, uh, it encounters pulses of high shear or high acceleration or high vorticity more frequently near a surface. So I wanted to ask you to think about or speculate about um, uh, whether an organism can surf to leave a surface or to move towards a surface. Okay, yeah, so this navigation <coughs> problem or trying to find a settlement area or trying to escape the, the, the hatching area actually is, gets a bit more complex than the vertical migration problem because you have to find where you want to go, right? So a big part of the problem is actually trying to find this target direction. But indeed, as you said, near the flow boundaries, in general, there are high shears and a high intensity of this flow velocity gradient. So one thing that we could do, and that's, that's something that I tried, is try to, if we have a bit more, uh, a, a bit more information about the flow, one thing that we can do is try to actually uh, find the direction that is the gradient of the intensity of the flow velocity gradient, right? And this information, actually, you can get it from a local information, from a higher derivatives of the, of the flow velocity gradient. And that's actually what I plot here. So on the, on the top, ah, sorry, maybe I can put it bigger. Yeah. On the top, the, the, the resulting uh, direction that we would get by following the gradient uh, instantaneously would be this, with the, the wall that is situated on the, on the bottom here. However, if we average, if we assume that we, we can average our temporal measure of 
as we, if we are just able to swim always in that direction, in the end, we would end up going towards the direction of the nearest wall. And so that's indeed something interesting because, uh, because yeah, we, we would be able to kind of try to get to, uh, to, 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 to settlement areas just by using a hydrodynamical cues. I don't know if it's clear. Yes, so are these little red arrows, what are they? The, sorry, the, this, the little red arrows are the direction, the estimated direction towards the wall that can be estimated from local uh, measure, from a local measure of the flow velocity of the higher derivatives of the flow velocity gradient. So this is the, direct, the estimated direction of the wall if we measure local information at that position. So this just so is... So this is not where the larvae are going. This is what they could sense. Exactly. So this is what they can sense. Yes. So in the, lower, in the lower graph, they could know where the wall was a greater distance away from it. Is that right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. But they would need and to so average what they measure. And, and um, of course, near a wall, we know from experiments with real larvae that are oblong, they get rotated in the high um, steep velocity gradients near the wall. Um, so they're, uh, you know, they can't just pick to swim a direction. And so how, if you were to pursue this question, how would you um, deal with the fact that the larvae are being rotated um, and, uh, and then they have this, is, this is very interesting that, that your ability to know where the wall is from the hydrodynamic signal uh, can be different under different circumstances. Um, so how, just, you know, because you haven't, haven't done this yet, but how do you, well, what do you think would be a good approach to try to address a question like that? So, yeah, yeah, so that's indeed a very, very, a very hard problem, this rotation. Uh, due to, to, to shear stress because this would actually, when we, we took, uh, take a look a bit about the literature about that, we can see that it would, uh, in practice, tend to, to push our microsumer away from the surface, right? I think that, for, yeah, yeah, because it, 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 the more you will get closer to the wall, the more the gradient and the shear increases, so the more you will rotate, so the more you will tend to get away from that wall. So you need to overcome this problem in practice if you want to settle. But one way to overcome it is maybe just, but I don't know, is maybe just to not have uh, a smooth wall, a smooth straight wall. Because if your wall is not, has some roughness, of course, I mean, you will have some high shear regions, but at, at some regions of the floor, things will become unsteady and things where you, you can hope for some regions that are not that, hopefully, not that, uh, you know, where the shear is not that strong and where you can actually settle. But I think there is no real solution. You have to, you have to wait for the flow to, 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 to actually let you settle. But maybe that's also an interesting question in some way. Maybe we can design a navigation strategy so that you can try to find this uh, low, actually low shear region where you can actually settle. And that, yeah, that's another problem that we could address. And uh, maybe using a, a similar approach, trying to, to find a solution based on, on higher orders of the measure of the flow velocity, the spatial derivative of the, the flow velocity could lead to such a behavior, yeah. Yeah, so it is interesting because many um, larvae do settle in, you know, behind bumps and things like that. And yeah. people usually think it's it's either because an eddy swirled them in there or because it's easier to stick to the bottom there. But it would be really interesting to explore whether that's where they end up just because of the, their interaction of their swimming in the water. And another interesting question would be, um, you know, we, we've just been talking about the larvae getting to a surface, but um, what's, what's the optimal strategy for a, a newly released larva that wants to get away versus a mature larva that wants to get towards the wall? 
Um, you know, it'd be, be interesting to, to compare the best escape strategy with the best landing strategy uh, down the road. Yes, um, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that's other people have asked the other questions I had listed to ask you, so okay. um, I think I'm done. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Mimi. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have a full round of questions, and we can let Remy go, maybe. And we can ask if you want to question it. <laughs> no, I think I, it was already covered by many other questions, so it was position things. We, we can, okay, we can let it go. Okay, we can have a world. So maybe maybe I will do it in French. Yeah, that's like everybody can hear. Bon, je vais te faire rapide hein, pour un petit peu de gai, ami. Donc tu vas jouer tout d'abord euh, sur un support présentation pour un peu de travail que tu as effectué. Euh, je voudrais donc juste de noter, noter deux choses sur, sur ton travail. Donc, euh, alors déjà, c'est dans une extrême indépendance dans laquelle tu as fait le euh, travail. C'est euh, toutes les explorations que tu, tu, as, tu as faites pendant ton travail, c'est de ton initiative. Tu as été extrêmement indépendant pour, pour vraiment trouver toutes les différentes possibilités euh, possibles de comprendre ton problème. Donc ça, c'est une indépendance importante à noter parce que c'est une qualité vraiment, vraiment importante. Et la deuxième qualité aussi, c'est que je voudrais noter, c'est le fait que tu es extrêmement curieux, que tu as, as voulu explorer de manière systématique un grand nombre de problèmes, et que, que ça, c'est une qualité, je pense, qui est très importante pour rester dans, dans le milieu académique. Et donc, c'est tout ce que je, je te souhaite, parce que vraiment, ce, cette curiosité, le fait que tu aies exploré de manière spontanée un grand nombre de problèmes, c'était vraiment un, un plaisir. Et, et moi, je connaissais, je viens plutôt du milieu de la turbulence, donc je ne connaissais pas grand-chose à ce problème-là avant de venir à la tête, donc j'espère que. Tu as appris autant de choses que moi pendant cette, <rire> cette thèse. Je pense. Et, et je te souhaite euh, un meilleur pour, pour la suite. Merci, Merci beaucoup. Euh, on va faire voler, moi. Rémi, il a été trois ans wonderfuls. Et quand tu es venu à travailler sur les problèmes de problème de structure, tu as terminé par faire quelque chose de complètement différent, mais j'espère que tu l'aimes. As uh, Benjamin said, you, it was more collaboration than uh, supervision, in fact. And uh, yeah, you are like a colleague among us. And uh, you, what you have achieved uh, during these three years is really impressive uh, because you did. Uh, well, you came up with uh, the ideas. You you did all the coding. You tested everything. You came up with many different variations and many different ways to to assess the robustness and the, the and plenty of other questions. Uh, even though you don't uh, present it, everything that is in your manuscript, your manuscript does not include everything you did during these three years. <laughs> you also started on the completely different problems that are not in the manuscript. And uh, yeah, because of that, like Benjamin, I really think that you are, if anyone is suited to do research, it's you. So I really hope you, <laughs> you will pursue uh, in this direction, even though we cannot guarantee any, yeah. any job. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, minor, the only minor issue at the moment, but uh, uh, yeah, I really hope we can uh, work again, and uh, sure. whatever happens, I wish you all the best, and uh, yeah, we, we'll all miss you, and uh, we will remember you uh, for a long time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.